So you have to take each independent musical work. Nomenclature has to be done. And then you submit it with the duration. That takes a certain time and effort. The bulk of the work has to be done by the uh, background score composers in terms of uh, cue sheets. But uh, the value of their work is determined as being one-sixth. That is completely not fair. Namaste and welcome to Music Mephil India. He has a huge body of work, most notably the background music of serials such as Balika Vadhu, Savdhan India, Crime Patrol and 125 or so such TV shows. He has won multiple awards for his work and has served on the committees of MCAI, IPRS and similar organizations. He has even produced an award-winning Marathi film. In this conversation, Ashish Rego has generously shared his experience and some bitter truths that are prevalent in our music industry today, along with insights from the milestones in his career. I'm Aruna Jade, a musician and educator, and it is my privilege to host this series where we speak to the Davids and the Goliaths, the loners and the tribes of the Indian music scene, for these are the stories of music from India. So, are you with uh, MCAI now? Mm, not really. I, mean, oh. I resigned as general secretary. I resigned as member. They have not accepted my resignation. I am not member according to me. I cannot mm. be sued for anything they do. And mm. I cannot be held responsible for any decisions they make. What what so were they or uh, as in tumultuous so decisions? The thing is that they have joined the federation again. Mm. Which is something I had got them out of. What is this federation? Federation of Western India Senior Employees. Okay. And I was treasurer of the federation okay. once upon a time. And uh, I was also vice president of the All India Film Employees Confederation. Okay. So most of the trade associations were part of FWIC. Mm. When FWIC got uh, taken over by uh, political and gunda elements, mm. I got MCI out of there. Mm. Because uh, we all agreed that it's not our place to be part of such an organization. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, uh, they had called for a strike, which we were not in agreement with. Mm. But we were forced to be part of the strike because we were members. Yeah. So we didn't want to be put in that position again in future. Mm. So that's why we said, let's... Uh, also, the Competition Commission case was filed against uh, FWIC and the affiliates. Mm. So I deposed in front of the commission in uh, Delhi. Mm. And I had to defend the position of uh, MCI there. So I managed to do it. So MCI didn't get fined. Mm. But that was again because of my knowledge of the issue and the knowledge of the law. Mm. I also defended Feist there. Mm. Because I was treasurer at the same time. And Feist didn't get fined. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to be in that position again. Mm. Because a lot of other associations which are corrupt. Mm. And they are uh, basically... Openly flouting the law, extorting money, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Ours is not that kind of an association. We don't stand for those values. Mm -hmm. So it's not our place to be here. Right. Which is why MCI, uh, we took a collective decision to move out of FICE. Can we talk about that too? Sure. I mean, oh. <clears throat> I had to go back a long way. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, General Secretary of MCI for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a couple of years, we realized that we are in an industry... And nothing much is being done for the people who are part of that industry. Mm. And uh, that includes music composers because, I mean, uh, there are no regulations. Mm. Labor laws are being continuously flouted. Mm. And uh, we felt that the management at FWIC was exceedingly corrupt. Mm -hmm. Extortion was happening. So we wanted to make a change. So okay. some associations got together. We stood for elections and we won. Hmm. We won over a committee which had been there for the past uh, 12 to 15 years and who did everything in their power, hmm. everything, hmm. to make sure we lost. Wow. Despite all the odds, we won. Okay. So, we started, I mean, we uh, made our committee, we started work, things like that. But funnily, we realized that we were the only people who wanted corruption to be out of there. Mm. 
Mm. Everybody else was fine with it. Mm. Producers had no issue with it. Right. Because they were willing to pay that little extra buck to exploit the workers. Mm. And that's what the earlier management was doing. And the by workers you mean uh, all workers. Now the federation was made up at that point I think of 22 associations. Mm. Which included everybody from the spot boy mm. to the cinematographer, director, writer, composer, mm. actors. Right. Some of these have now moved out. Yeah. Like along with MCI, the FWA moved out, which is now the Screenwriters Association. Mm -hmm. The Cine Artists Association moved out, which is Sinta now. Mm -hmm. And uh, Choreographers Association moved out. So a lot of the uh, technician associations per se, they moved yeah. out. But uh, others were there. Even the directors had moved out, then they rejoined. Mm -hmm. So MCI now again rejoined after mm -hmm. I resigned, that is. Mm -hmm. I don't know what reasons they have, but I'm definitely not supportive of those. Mm. Because in my opinion, the people who are at the helm at FWIC are definitely not there for the best interest of the workers. Mm. So, uh, I stood for elections at IFEC. Because, what is uh, IFEC? All India Film Employees Confederation. Okay. Now, there are six uh, primary federations across India. Mm. And which is uh, Bengal, then uh, the four South Indian states, yeah, Mumbai, mm -hmm. so six, four plus two. Yeah. So the, North, North doesn't have any? North doesn't have an organized federation. Because mm. they don't have an organized film industry. If you see the main mm. film industries, yeah, Bollywood, what would you, I mean, the Hindi film industry. Yeah. Then you have Kollywood, they mm. call the Bengali film industry. Yeah. Then you have Tollywood, which is the four South Indian, each of them have an independent film industry. Yeah. Kannada, Telugu, Tamil and uh, Malayalam. Malayalam. Mm. So very distinct film industries which are defined. Mm. But in the north, I mean, show me a film industry. <laughs> Most of them come to Mumbai to work. Yeah. Yeah, they're mm. not being developed as such. But now lately the local languages, some films are being made. Mm -hmm. Punjab is a different ball game, but even yeah. Punjab, they, they have their own shooting floors there, but technicians they use from here. Mm. So they've not kind of organized themselves into an industry per se. So there are six uh, federations as of Six thing. federations, which together make up one confederation, which mm -hmm. is IFEC. Oh, okay. So I stood for elections in IFEC and I was elected uh, vice president. Mm -hmm. And uh, What year was this? So I think uh, seven, eight years back, I don't remember, mm -hmm. or more than that, okay. or 10 years back. And uh, the IFIC term is, I think, around three years. So I was there for three years. Mm. But even there, I saw that uh, strength of each federation varied. Mm -hmm. The Kerala Federation was very strong. Mm -hmm. The uh, Tamil Federation was strong, but they were stuck with rules and regulations which are archaic. Mm antiquated they don't move with the times mm. Kannada Federation was very weak mm. yeah and same thing with the Telugu Federation they were like uh, completely under the thumb of the actors directors and distributors mm. the Bengal Federation towards the later years kind of got uh, assimilated with the political party in power mm. so they became uh, extended arm of a political party right and uh, FWIC, which is the Western India Federation, uh -huh. they kind of came under the control again of political plus gundaism. Mm. So there were charge sheets filed against office bearers of FWIC not some time back regarding mm. the death of a suicide of an art director mm. who named some of them as extortionists in the charge sheet. With what intent did you stand for those elections? What were you hoping to achieve? Well, I suppose what I was hoping to achieve was what battle of good over evil, like good triumphs, evil losers, and uh, very idealistic at that yeah. point in time. So, uh, but then I realized that corruption can never really be eliminated. Mm. It can only be managed and regulated. Mm. Because it is so seeped into the system yeah. that to remove it will 
probably ensure that you are removed from the system mm. rather than the corruption right. for scoring political points or maybe not just for money for any other interest they have mm-hmm. political ambitions power control mm-hmm. revenge <laughs> motivation could be any That's right but still corruption what happened during the term and then after yeah during the term was a nice roller coaster ride we had uh, two strikes which were called first one which i was in favor of second one i wasn't in favor of mm-hmm. but we were dragged into the second strike mm-hmm. because the rest of the unions wanted it mm-hmm. and they just couldn't sustain right yeah strike is not an easy thing to culminate right and uh, the channels and the producers knew weaknesses mm. they exploited disunity in the members of course and that's how they got rid of the strike right because everyone so, has to eat at the yes. end of the day that point in time i realized that the strike is of no use mm-hmm. neither my members were in favor of that strike neither was i mm. but we were unfortunately dragged into it and my being posi- in the position of treasurer didn't really help mm. so i didn't stand for re-election after that because mm-hmm. i was placed in an awkward situation where i was compelled to act against my own uh, choice mm. and then what about your term in mcai well i was uh, there for multiple terms as general secretary of mcai yeah <clears throat> when i joined mci we were i mean i think we had around 500 members or something mm-hmm. there were no systems in place mm-hmm. we were disunited there were no verticals mm-hmm. we got all of that into place okay uh sanjay tandon came as ceo he also brought a lot of systemization into the organization so what are some of these systems firstly we changed the entire constitution okay yeah we introduced verticals for film tv advertisement and non film hmm ad composers had never been part of the association neither had tv composers oh we integrated all the different composer streams mm-hmm. into the association membership kind of tripled we tripled the membership over the years yeah and uh, we were working on shoestring budgets with minimal uh, people mm-hmm. and team members but still we managed this yeah we uh, modernized we started our own website we gave each composer a page on that website where they could display their fresh works mm-hmm. and even in that website we innovated a lot mm-hmm. with respect yeah. to allowing lyricists to come and showcase their lyrics there yeah then uh, in the meantime we were having this entire battle for the copyright amendment bill in 2012 yeah. so the mci was uh, foremost behind that bill in terms of both funding as well as uh, being in the forefront with mr javed akhtar at that point in time right if you could describe what this bill was about so all over the world composers are paid royalties for performance of their work in public but taking advantage of a 1977 judgment mm-hmm. music companies and uh, broadcasters stop paying composers royalty correct yeah because they chose to interpret the law based on that single judgment yeah that judgment had a dissenting view also mm-hmm. it was never really considered mm. so uh, mr akhtar spear headed the movement mm-hmm. by which uh, he became a member of parliament and brought it to the notice of the lawmakers at that point in time mm-hmm. because of which the copyright amendment bill came into being to bring india on par at least if not ahead of the rest of the world mm. so that copyright amendment bill was opposed to the nail by music companies producers right yeah because nobody wants to give money to the creators of the musical work mm. yeah. yeah so or uh, they wanted to treat music like a product like you buy it yeah and that's it then pay you have nothing hire. pay for hire work for mm. hire They're still attempting to do that mm-hmm. despite the bill being in place because of some ridiculous contracts which they have in place yeah and they compel composers and authors to sign those contracts so as an association we organized funding we went for representations with the parliament members mm-hmm. uh with lawmakers with lawyers 
all across. And at the end of the day, the bill was passed. Hmm. So when the bill was passed, we celebrated. We said, now... What year was it passed in? 2012. Okay. So we said, Joe, happy days are here again. I mean, and a good day is going to come <laughs> for us. But little did we realize that hmm. uh, it's passed on paper. Mm-hmm. Execution is a whole different ballgame. Yeah. So we were stonewalled at every stage by producers and channels mm-hmm. who sought to see that uh, we don't get the royalties which are due to us. Mm. Now in television channels, uh, Star Plus has started paying and uh, Sony has started paying, Z has started paying, but mm. Viacom is still not paying royalties. Mm. Most of the other OTTs are not paying royalties. Oh. And even uh, South Indian broadcasters, a lot of them are not paying royalties. So as far as implementation goes. And how are there no consequences for them? uh, Lengthy legal battles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you made the law, but you've not put consequences there. Mm. It's like uh, telling a kid you don't do your homework, but we won't tell you what happens if you don't do it. Mm. So then the kid says, you never told me what what was going to happen. Now you can't do anything about it. Mm. So if you have a problem, then I'll take you to court. And you all know what I, I mean. You know what happens in court. Mm. Who has the money? Who has the lawyers? Mm. Case gets dragged on. So I think uh, some of the cases are in court. Some of the cases haven't even reached court. Mm. Because again, you have to choose your battles. Yeah. How many cases are you going to fight at the same time? Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're fighting cases in high courts and you're engaging senior counsels, mm-hmm. we all know a senior counsel charges anything between five to ten lakhs per hearing. Whose money is that? Yeah. So. So continuing on with MCAI. So with MCAI, uh, uh, we got the entire force together and uh, we got all kinds of composers under one platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, we reached a stage again because of IPRS where I resigned. Mm -hmm. I was on the board of directors of IPRS for around three, four years. Mm -hmm. My second term got over. I resigned because Mm -hmm. the first term was a shorter term Mm -hmm. because it was a kind of in-between term. Yeah. And at that point in time, I resigned because I saw uh, injustice being done to composers of background score. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there were around 100 crores of money which were collected and primarily to do with broadcast. Mm. And that money caught the eye of the publishers and other people there. And they said, why should this bulk of this money go to composers of background score? Because right. most of the works published on television mm-hmm. have background score in them. Yeah. They don't have songs. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody has kind of ganged up. And uh, since our term got over, Raju and me, Mm-hmm. Didn't stand for re-election again. Mm. And the the people who got elected were two lyricists. Mm. Who were definitely unsympathetic. Right. To background score composers getting royalty. Mm-hmm. The first meeting they had, they passed a rule saying that one-tenth valuation for background score with respect to songs. On what basis? On their own whims and fancies. There were no basis provided. Mm-hmm. And they distributed. We fought against that tooth and nail. Mm-hmm. But we sent representations to the government. Mm-hmm. No use. Multiple representations. We sent representation to the copyright board. Nothing happened. Mm. So, uh, we all got one-tenth of what we were supposed to get. So, that bulk of the money was then distributed among publishers, lyricists and song composers. Mm. So they wanted to put a policy again into place to keep this for future works. Hmm. Even there, they had an offer of one sixth. From one tenth, they came to one sixth. Mm -hmm. Whereas across the world, the maximum they have is half. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But here in India, Hmm. we have one sixth. There are two creators. You have the song composer and the lyricist. Mm-hmm. But if it comes to background score, yeah, well, you only have the composer. Correct. 
and you have the publisher who's the channel. Yeah. Now, when the channel pays the royalties, he removes his publisher half and pays the royalties. So you should ideally get hundred. Yes. So that was the scam that was happening, and that, it's still happening there. That took ten seconds to understand. I don't see why. It's very simple, but yeah. people don't want to understand it mm. because it doesn't suit their purpose to understand it. Right. I mean, I gave interviews in um, a very prominent uh, online magazine, mm-hmm. and uh, I gave a fireside chat with Anil Vanbari, who's the president of IndianTelevision dot com. Mm-hmm. In both places, mentioning in detail mm-hmm. uh, the injustice that was going on at IPRS. Okay. And uh, consequences were that they sent me a, a show cause notice saying that I should be expelled from IPRS. And because I had disclosed privileged information, so in reply, I made them understand how none of the information I had disclosed was privileged, mm-hmm. and how they should in turn be expelled from IPRS, not me. Right. Because of what they had done. Well, uh, I think that was the end of the show cause notice. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I stood for elections later, they tried every dirty trick in the book to ensure that I wasn't elected. Yeah. They disclosed publicly mm-hmm. the amount of royalty I had made, mm-hmm. which is privileged information. Now that is privileged. Yeah. And they leaked it on the eve of the election. To prejudice and influence the voters, saying uh-huh. that see Ashish Raygaon makes this much money, uh-huh. he's not going to stand for your interests. Mm. Did that work? I lost the election. Right. So in a way, I suppose it had the impact it wanted. They wanted, mm-hmm. but it was a complete illegal action. Right. Which they refused to accept responsibility for, saying that it was an independent action by an independent director of the board. Mm. So that director resigned. Mm. You must have given this a lot of thought. How can this be solved? I mean, execution is something else, but what about a solution? Ooh, I'm still giving it thought. <laughs> so the fact is, you're up against people who have loads of money, mm-hmm. who have uh, endless pockets mm. to use against you and stonewall you wherever you go. Mm. Now, if the government is not willing to listen, mm. the only option is the court. So when you go to court, you're going to they're going to just keep dragging the case on for years and years. Mm-hmm. So what is the point? If the people themselves, I'm talking about the composers, lyricists, are not aware mm-hmm. of their own situation, how can you help them? True. If that awareness is being supplemented by greed. Mm-hmm. And despite the greed, they're not making anything. Then they're not really going to progress anywhere. Mm. This is only possible by a mass movement. I stood alone for as long as I could. Mm-hmm. Then I quit. I quit from all public posts. I quit from the post of uh, general secretary of MCI. I quit from the post of vice chairman of APMA. Mm. And now I'm focusing on my own music. Speaking of your own music, uh, it, the period you mentioned, you were. Uh, in all these roles were, uh, was also the period when you were doing a lot of work. So, yeah. how, how is there a clone of you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> multiple doing... clones, actually. <laughs> multiple clones of me. So, I had, uh, mm-hmm. I was probably one of the few composers who has systemized their entire working pattern. Mm-hmm. And in television, uh, there was one time where I was doing 14 shows. Wow. Simultaneously, dailies. And I had an entire team of people working with me mm-hmm. and uh, compartmentalized into various different roles and responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Because of that, I took care of the ideation. Mm-hmm. So that part was completely with me, set the tone for the show mm-hmm. and enabled them to take over for the rest of the show. Mm-hmm. So if you understand the uh, value and uh, possibility of systemization, any business can be systemized and music had become a business by then. Yeah. So that enabled me to the kind of uh, volumes of work that I did. I mean, even now, I mean, probably uh, over 130 TV shows, over 23,000 episodes of music. Lovely. Yeah. And have you registered all of this music? Uh, more than half of the music is registered. Oh. With IPRs. Right. 
How how do you deal with cue sheets? Well, I engage uh, external vendors for cue sheets oh. because considering the volumes of work that I'm I have been doing, it's mm-hmm. almost impossible mm. to do it myself. Plus, IPLS had not made it that that point in time very easy for score composers to register cue sheets. Yeah. So better to engage somebody who can get into the system and uh, fulfill that responsibility. Does it have to be that complicated? Well, it doesn't have to be, but unfortunately, it is. Mm-hmm. I'm still looking forward to them simplifying the process. Mm-hmm. Now, in fact, they've started uh, they do, uh, registering sound recordings. Now, the sound recording again. Mm-hmm. What happens in a song? You just take a song mm-hmm. and you submit it. Yeah. In a score. It's made up of multiple music works. Yes. So you have to take each independent musical work. Mm-hmm. Nomenclature has to be done, mm-hmm. and then you submit it with the duration. Yeah. That takes a certain time and effort. So, the bulk of the work has to be done by the uh, background score composers in terms of uh, cue sheets. Mm-hmm. But uh, the value of their work is determined as being one sixth. Mm. That is completely not fair. Mm. Song composers have a medium of, uh, and lyricists and publishers have the medium of radio. They have the medium of uh, streaming platforms like Spotify, yeah. YouTube. Mm. The only place score composers have is television and broadcast. Mm. Just where they are making money in one place, they yeah. have been uh, victimized and discriminated against. Mm. That is extremely unfortunate. And so what is the path forward? As I said, the path forward is that people get together and uh, protest and take action. But if there's no getting together, mm-hmm. there's no action. Is there a way technology can simplify this? I think technology right now is working at simplifying the profile itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh. So very soon you may not need any lyricists. Mm. may not need any song composers and maybe in the not so distant future need any score composers <laughs> yeah. so simplification is on its way mm. and uh, considering what i'm seeing that ai is doing that ai has already been registered abroad as a member of a copyright society and has also received royalties it's happened in france uh-huh. happening in germany so don't be surprised uh-huh. when ai is admitted you mean to say the developers or the company behind the AI. owner of that ai yeah becomes the creator of the work hmm but it's trained on existing works made by other artists every existing work yeah is even by a composer hmm. at some point in time was a der- derivative whether consciously or unconsciously. Right. So in that aspect, AI is no different. Mm. You cannot morally argue on that ground. Mm. And uh, more often I would say humans are conscious plagiarizers than AI. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Have you studied the law? Yes, I studied the law. I have uh, I was a student of Government Law College. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and studied law there. Majored yeah. in copyrights and patents. And um, what about the rest of your education? Well, I did my graduation in microbiology and biochemistry. Why was that? Well, when I passed 12th standard, my dad wanted me to do medicine. (laughs) But I didn't want to do medicine. (laughs) Uh So at that point in time, I kind of wanted to do an MBA. Mm -hmm. So we came to the compromise that I could finish my graduation. Mm-hmm. in microbiology because it was nearest to medicine mm-hmm. and then do an MBA mm. which is why I ended up doing microbiology and you never got to the MBA well by that time I realized I wanted to do music <laughs> so my goals and directions had shifted tell us a little bit about your first instruments and beginnings well my uh, first instrument was always the violin mm-hmm. and mom wanted to be a violinist mm. she was a self-taught violinist Oh, wow. Yeah, and she used to conduct church choirs and things like that. So she always wanted me to take up the violin. So at the age of nine, Mm -hmm. I took up the violin. And uh, at the age of 11, I gave my first solo performance with orchestra. 
Which orchestra was this? This was the Bombay Players Orchestra mm-hmm. at Parker Hall. Mm-hmm. I performed a, a fast violin concerto with orchestra, which was a big thing at that year, that time because you didn't have that many young violinists performing with orchestra. True, true. And uh, then I became in another two years. I became the leader of the orchestra. Mm. Then I performed with the Delhi Symphony and other various different orchestras. and until i reached my uh, graduation time mm-hmm. where i was called for a recording i never played a recording before mm. and uh, this was at mehboob studio mm. they were running short of violinists mm. so i went for the recording i finished the recording and they gave me 500 rupees big so, money 500 rupees at that point oh. in time was big money yeah and i said what for 4 hours work mm. so i was very happy I said, yeah, I this I play violin all the time. Hmm. I'm getting paid so much money for it, then why not take it up as a career? Next day, I got called for another recording, and it hmm. turned out to be the recording of Lakshmi Kant Pyare. Wow! So hmm. I saw Pyare Bai for the first time that day. Mm-hmm. Always admired their work, but then got to meet them in person. What year was this? This was 1993. Hmm. So how many years back is that? Thirty. Yeah. Oh yeah, thirty. Exactly. Thirty years back, hmm. and uh, I said, "Great! So this is what I want to do." And then I didn't get called for a long time for any recording. <laughs> so then I realized I had to give an audition at hmm. the Cine Musicians Association, mm-hmm. and uh, I gave the audition there, and uh, they gave me a B grade. Hmm. So I said, "How do I qualify for a B grade?" I said no, we can't give you A straight away. So we're giving you B. I said that's not a justification. Is this association still functioning? Yes. In another one year, I became the general secretary of that association. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, I gave my audition. In one year, I became the general secretary mm. at the old age of nineteen. Mm. Yeah. So at nineteen, I was the youngest general secretary of any association mm. in the federation. And I had uh, there was like a trial by fire at that mm. age. You've got veterans who are uh, breathing down your back and <laughs> blowing fire at you and stuff like that. And I took a lot of uh, courageous calls at that point in time, mm. which led to a lot of controversy. Because even at that time, I was battling corruption. I've been mean, like battling it all my life. Mm. But, at nineteen, uh, at must 19, be yeah, much yeah. more idealistic. Yeah, I kept kept going idealistic, but yeah, at nineteen it was like, why should this be this way? Yeah, it's not supposed to be. And uh, I saw that a lot of people were making money on the side, and musicians were getting targeted. Mm. So I started my campaign at that point in time. Then I was, uh, I think, around five six years. I was uh, general secretary. Then I resigned. I focused mm-hmm. on my career. Mm. till i became general secretary of uh, mci mm. there at that wow. point in time so whenever injustice becomes uh, impossible for me to tolerate i end up taking a position of responsibility <laughs> then with with all the decisions whether creative or in this case um, a sort of um, justice seeking decisions that you've taken because it all You still have twenty four hours in the day. Yes. So every decision you make comes at the cost of everything else right. that you could have said a yes to. Holistically speaking. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, what kind of support have you had all these years from family, friends, community? Well, my wife definitely wanted to be me it, me to be completely away from anything like this. I mean, yeah. considering her protective nurturing nature and also considering the time i spent away from her because of these activities understandably so yeah yeah but she was always supportive mm. an extremely brave and courageous woman herself mm. and uh, my dad who just passed away recently i'm sorry to he was the epitome of courage and walking the talk mm. so i had good role models within the family itself mm. because uh, That's why for me, never f- no fear of consequences. I had, 
and that enabled me to be true to myself. And rather than compromise, I chose to leave at any point in time. People, I mean, give me that respect that they never ever offer me a bribe for anything. Mm. Because they have that much faith in me. Mm. Right. Or even offer me something which is uh, tempting or attempt to tempt me in any way. Mm. Quit pro quo. Yeah. So the fact is that uh, even though I have stood against a lot of people, mm -hmm. those people have nothing personal against me because they know I have stood for what I have believed in. But the price has to be paid. Mm. At one point in time, I was uh, boycotted by most of the TV channels that were there. People refused to give me work. What? Because what? I stood for uh, the rights of background score composers. What, what year was this? Well, it was a continuing process from the past six, seven years, mm. in fact. Whereas from where I was doing 14 shows, mm. I ended up coming to doing one show. Wow. Mm. And again, it got uh, amplified because of the strike. Again, which wasn't my fault. Yeah. It again got amplified because of my stand on contracts, because I refused to sign contracts which were illegal or discriminatory in any way. Whereas the other people just took a pen and signed them without reading them. Can we talk a bit about those, those sure. contracts? Okay. So, what are the commonly found um, clauses that are outright unfair and what should they ideally be? Well, I say that uh, work made for hire shouldn't be there in contracts. Hmm. Ideally, it should be work under the yeah. Copyright Act. Because you are making people sign work made for hire mm -hmm. contracts and you are making them sign an assignment deed. Hmm. You can't have both. Right. If it is work made for hire, hmm. there is no need of assignment. Correct. Yeah. And if you are making them sign that, means you are recognizing the fact that they are the first owner of the work. Yeah. So it's a contradiction in itself. In itself, right. So that is something which definitely needs to be hmm. uh, remedied in contracts. And uh, apart from that, what else is there? Does the perpetuity clause still show up a lot? Yeah, perpetuity clause shows up. <laughs> All the usual suspects show up. And uh, I think uh, they're waiting for the day in which the Copyright Amendment Act will be amended again in their favor. <laughs> so that they can implement those. Right. There's also huh, a very important and interesting thing which they have is advance royalties. Okay. This entire thing called advance royalties. So we are mm. paying you money, mm. which we are supposed to pay you for doing the work. Yeah. But those are advance royalties. That's not payment for doing the work. So mm. you don't, they will be adjusted against any royalties you are supposed to get, which defeats oh. the purpose of royalties. In the beginning, right. a lot of companies and people had started with these kind of contracts. Mm. But that really shows they had no intention in paying. Mm. They came up with this. Then they started management contracts. Mm. like companies like even Yashraj at that mm. point in time came up with management contracts T-Series came up with their management contracts and management contracts state a lot of them did that we are managing you as an artist so mm. from your royalties and other earnings we are going to take this much money back as management fees typically when somebody somebody is managing you yeah. what what does the work actually entail Unfortunately, in India, the concept of manager is like somebody who's like arranging your schedule, you know. Mm -hmm. But actually abroad, manager is much more than that. Right. They're more than your booking agent. Yeah, if you agent. look at the movie Elvis, uh -huh. it's the manager who made Elvis True. in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah. And agent is completely separate from manager. Hmm. They're two well-defined roles. Right. But in India now, what you have is management companies mm -hmm. where corporates have come up, they sign up artists. Yeah. And if you want to get work, you have to be part of some management company or the other. Yeah. It's again become cartelization and monopolies. Mm -hmm. So if you're not part of the clique, yeah. then they don't give you work. If you're part of the clique, they'll give you work and they'll take back money as management fees. Mm -hmm. It's another racket. <laughs> so if you want work, get signed up. Yeah. But so, how is the management contract um, not a management contract? Because they are not managing you firstly. Yeah. One. Yeah. The intention is only to take back money from you in any way possible. 
And if you put a clause in the contract saying that 50% of your royalties are going to come back mm. or a clause that we will collect your royalties on your behalf. Mm. Like I'm not capable of collecting royalties. I don't have a bank account. Yeah. My money cannot come into my bank account. Uh-huh. So it has to come into your bank account to come to me. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Those kind of clauses are downright, what do you call? Exploitative. Exploitative and fraudulent. Hmm. Yeah, because the attempt to cheat the person of what the law has given him hmm. is obvious and apparent. Wow, uh, um, it's still sinking in. So, uh, I I was completely unaware of this, uh, the management contracts, uh, because it's absurd. It's it's just an absurd contract to put forth to a composer. I would say so, that uh, I mean. The copyright amendment bill mm. brought out more creativity in the lawyers than it did in the composers. <laughs> yeah, the mm. sole purpose of lawyers' existence at that point in time mm. was to dig up more creative ways mm. to jip the creators out of their money. Mm. So each lawyer, they should have had a contest, in fact, yeah. which is the most creative clause <laughs> in agreements, which can take composers' money. and give it to the managers publishers or whoever for the absolute noobs uh, could you uh, simplify it down to what does the copyright amendment act 2012 say okay so the copyright amendment act the primary aspect of the act confers the right of in inalienable right which mm-hmm. is you it cannot be taken away from you yeah to royalty to creators of musical work mm. yeah also creators of dramatic work yeah and other works right. but since we talking about music here mm. if you are a song writer mm-hmm. if you are a composer if you are a creator if you are a performer that right cannot be taken away from you yeah. you cannot sign away that right yeah. because you are in a position where you can be exploited mm. somebody else will pay you 1000 rupees and take away the right of a lifetime from you mm-hmm. that was what was safeguarded and secured in the copyright copyright amendment bill yeah. and that was a huge step forward mm. but then to put it into practice as i said earlier is a whole yeah. different ball game yeah let's talk about your work sure okay so where where did background music composing begin for you i think in 2000 Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, I was part of a band, mm-hmm. and then um, at that point in time, I was looking at supplementing my income mm-hmm. by starting work which was regular in nature. Mm-hmm. I was already playing in the film industry as a musician, but recordings come; they don't come sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, I joined a music composer at that time called Mahesh Naik. Mm. He was. kind of ruling the roost at that point in time in terms of background music for television uh-huh. so i was lucky to be able to work with him and i started by programming for him mm-hmm. producing for him and i learned my uh, way ahead from there right then i got my first break as an independent composer in 2002 with the serial kagar mm. and uh, see uh, that show got me my first award also as best background score composer in television yeah so that was coincidentally the first year of indian television.com mm so i won five awards for best background score over the years uh uh-huh. until i stopped sending my work for nominations and uh, yeah so since then i have done 130 tv shows 23000 plus episodes of music Thirty oh. web series. Mm-hmm. What is your personal favorite work? I must all this. My personal favorite work is always Bali ka vadu. Hmm. Oh, why so? Because I got the freedom in that show to do exactly what I wanted to do. Right. And Bali ka vadu changed the landscape of background score in television. Right. It was also one of the longest running shows on TV. Yeah. Till Bali ka vadu. 
everybody used to follow the what do you call the balaji system of music <laughs> yeah yeah the dham 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 yeah. i mean you madras cut happening yeah. bangs everywhere all over the place and in balika wadu we had mm. no bangs huh. no fast motions we had music which suited the mindset mm. which uh, enhanced aspects which were probably not there in the uh, visual mm. and provided a third dimension to the visual yeah which is exactly how scoring should be done and i had colors was starting at that time they just started yeah. and this was one of their first shows so they were absolutely non interfering very supportive and uh, i got practically no feedback at all oh, wow yeah and that's why i'm saying i mean i enjoyed that experience the most which is not, probably not had with any other show what were the creative choices you made that was so different from the template well the instrument palette for one yeah yeah most of the instrumentation was digital mm-hmm. used to be on keyboards mm-hmm. i use instruments like sarangi flute chorus esraj mm-hmm. sitar sarod the entire indian palette of music uh-huh. also i used uh, western vocals aryatic voices mm. and uh, guitars acoustic guitars mm-hmm. to an extent but rag based mm. so allowing me to experiment with a variety of sounds which had not been heard in television till then mm. true true that way and i did it all at my own cost wow nobody paid for that i did it within the money because i wanted to do it right so did you go with the session artist route or did you program these songs? session artists i oh. engaged session artists hmm. to perform the pieces oh. and that's what i used that's yeah. why i mean sometimes you'll just find one sarangi playing with a pad below hmm or some strings or a choir below that that's it yeah but you feel the emotion of the scene hmm sometimes you'll just find one solo voice hmm and nothing below no bombastic music at all yeah but the pathos of the situation comes mm. out so beautifully mm whereas today we are compelled to use huge levels of orchestrations yeah. Yeah. under which emotion is buried and murdered mm. in the attempt that the public will feel something mm. and we are surprised that they don't mm we wonder why they are not feeling the emotion because you're hammering it into them Mm. you should not hammer emotion into people yeah. you should let them absorb it themselves yeah that's what we did in balika mm. evoke don't coach yes <laughs> don't manipulate people into feeling yeah. that okay so what are you currently working on if it's something you can reveal yeah i'm currently working on the show called neercha mm. for colors again a lovely sound palette which is a uh, bengali in nature mm mm-hmm. I love working on different uh, folk uh, kind of milieus of India. Yeah. I've worked pan India uh, soundscaping, and a uh, new show coming up soon, which is coming on Z. Yeah. Again with a Marathi bit of soundscaping there. So, Marathi reminds me, you were also the producer on Pak Pak Pakak. Yes. How did that happen? Ah, okay, that was. Uh, another experience altogether yes oh. again one of uh, my uh, happy or bitter sweet memories mm-hmm. so uh, i was already an, a successful tv composer at that point in time mm-hmm. and a uh, couple of my friends gautam and loy we got together and we started doing certain things and we wanted to move towards production mm-hmm. and uh, gautam was the hero for prahar which nana had directed okay and gautam said that uh, i have this script which is earlier written by my mom mm. sai paranj pe mm. and uh, i really want to do it in my way mm. and uh, he narrated the script to nana nana said yes mm. because he had promised gautam when you direct your film your first film mm. i will act in it now let's so then i funded the film i produced it from various <laughs> sources available to me but it mm. was completely funded by me mm. not that i had the money 
I arranged the money, borrowed it, yeah, got it into place from somewhere, and the film got made. Hmm. We shot in the jungles of Bhima Shankar, hmm. and the film has a lovely feel to it. Hmm. And uh, again, the experiences of film production completely different challenges from being a composer. Hmm. Yeah. Now you understand what a producer feels like, and in Marathi cinema. Again, if you are a producer, you have to distribute your own film. Yeah. So going about distributing the film, going from city to city, meeting theater owners, cracking deals. Yeah. That from being a creative person to being a financial person. Yeah. That transition probably happened at that time in me. Hmm. And uh, the film got released, and uh, we had a premiere at Ravindra Nathya Mandir. Hmm. The who's who of the Marathi industry and uh, many from the Hindi industry also were there, and the film got a standing ovation. Hmm. What do you like about the Marathi industry? Nothing. <laughs> so that I like anything about the Marathi industry. Uh-huh. The it, film just this? happened to be yeah. made in Marathi because hmm. it was written in Marathi. Right. After my second film, in fact, I swore never to produce another Marathi film ever again. <laughs> Okay, so the apt question would be, what do you hate about it? The fact is that when I get to a point where I don't like anything, I just mm. move away from that place. Mm. There's no point in fighting an entire system which is not going to improve. Mm. So I do my best at that point in time. I mean, I'm not a what do you call a crusader in everything I do. Right. I choose my battles. Yeah, and. Uh, We were given very raw treatment in the second film we did, hmm. which was I number one. Ah, and uh, we, I mean, people were jealous about the success of Pak 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 Pak. Hmm. So most people attempted in every way possible to ensure that I number one doesn't succeed. Hmm. Jealousy because suddenly you've got people who like not non Maharashtrian hmm. who've come. Into your industry, and are making films which are setting standards which are way beyond what were there at that point yeah. in time. Tribalism. Taking away all the awards, mm. so that jealousy crept in during the second film. Mm. So people stopped cooperating. They attempted in any way to give us bad press, bad publicity, mm. and that kind of got to the second film. Mm. The film also didn't turn out the way we wanted it to be. and we had numerous hurdles in releasing that film also hmm. because that film was about uh, a primary part of the film had to do with the police academy hmm. and we had characters like the commissioner at that point in time who was uh, had this constipation issue hmm. because of which he was constantly farting hmm. so we went to the censor here uh, yeah. committee censorship and some lady in that committee took umbrage to the fact that we were showcasing police in this manner hmm. where well, i said that from the films that i have seen so far hmm. this is probably the best depiction of the police <laughs> which anyone can give because all he is doing is farting <laughs> yeah in most of the films i have seen they are doing way way beyond that yeah so they didn't clear the film hmm. we had to go to the review committee the review committee cleared the film hmm they said there's nothing wrong with the film then that person kind of took it like a personal vendetta hmm and complained to the commissioner himself hmm the commissioner sent a notice to the censor board saying that this film cannot be cleared without police certification is that is that common procedure well uh, we were i think uh, blessed with it <laughs> rather than being common procedure hmm and uh, we had to organize a special screening mm. two days prior to the release date of the film mm. yeah suppose release date theaters have been booked everything is in place publicity has been released mm. and we haven't got a certificate yet yeah okay so two days before the release of the film we had to organize a sitting where five officers from the police force mm mm-hmm. would come and watch and they would only come to town so we had to book the entire yashwantrao chauhan auditorium for five people to watch a film 
Wow, royalty. Yes. And considering the small producers we were, it really pinched. Hmm. It's not cheap to book that order yeah. for him. They watched the film and they came back. Incidentally, one of the uh, officers, all these officers were of DCP and ACP rank. Mm -hmm. They're not small officers. Yeah. And uh, I was surprised that the police have got uh, more important things to do than fighting crime than coming and watching my film. Mm. So they kind of were very evasive. They said it's an entertaining film, but you should not make such films in the police. And I said, were you sleeping when all these films were being made so far? Mm. That all you are taking offense to is the commission of farting? <laughs> mm. Seriously? Yeah. I mean, if he's accepting bribes, it's fine. If he's womanizing, <laughs> it's fine. If there's an item number happening in the police station, that's fine. Mm. But farting is where you draw the line. Yeah. So they went back and they refused to clear the film. One more day left. Uh -huh. Only option we did, we could approach the Home Minister. Home Minister at that time was R.R. Patil. Uh -huh. He kindly granted as an audience. Yeah. And he called the Deputy Commissioner at that time mm. and said that, why are you harassing these guys? Mm. <laughs> what have they done and why are you not letting them release their film? Because Pak 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 Act by then was a huge hit and people it was acknowledged all over the world. We went to various festivals. Mm -hmm. We got... Uh, the most state awards that year. Yeah. So he said, okay, we will send a clearance, but we need certain cuts and things like that. So he said, what cuts are you looking at? We make it very minimal. Mm. Despite that, they send an entire long list of cuts to the sense board. Now, tomorrow is the release of the film. Mm. Yeah. There's no way we can incorporate those cuts and release the film. Mm. But the censor's office was so supportive that they mm. took a call saying that only two cuts will be made. This and this. Make those cuts. Get your prints ready. Release the film. Mm. By the middle of the night around, you can say 4 a.m. or 2 a.m. I think, the prints were ready and people physically went with those prints mm. to the theatres to deliver them so that the film could be released in time for the morning show. Mm. So that was <laughs> one adventure. How did the movie fare? It bombed big time. <laughs> Well, considering all that went wrong during the making of the movie mm. kind of reflected in the energy mm. and the final product was not again as I said what we wanted it to be film bombed uh, were you involved with the music of these films yeah I did, did the music for both of the films along with Casey Loy both of us together did the music oh, why? that's a lot of work <laughs> yeah we got the award for best, best uh, music also the mm. state awards for mm. Maharashtra state awards for Pak 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 yeah we got the best uh, music award at the Mata Saman Awards. So, mm. so music was appreciated. Wow. <laughs> Quite the journey. So yeah. what what's a current adventure outside of music that you are attempting? Well, for the past several years, I've been a lover of life and all things living. Mm -hmm. So animals per se has taken a lot of my time. Ah, yeah. I find them much more... Uh, <laughs> Congenial, much more better to deal with than human beings. Yeah. So, kind of devoted a lot of my time to them. Mm. And uh, they are an integral part of nature. They respond to you in ways in which you like being responded to. Yeah. They, are, they have a lot of gratitude in them, yeah. which is more than I can say for human beings. So, all in all, they're really cool people to hang out with. Mm. So, because of that, I mean, I like to hang out with them. At home, I have uh, 12 cats and three dogs. I have two dogs in the building below. Uh -huh. Again, so five dogs there. Uh, animals and humans can coexist together. Mm. Yeah, because human beings per se have eliminated the yeah. places where animals can either feed or take shelter. Hmm. It's our responsibility to integrate them into our lives so that they have a feeling of belonging. Yeah. So that is something, a mission which I am currently working on. In the office, we have another 15 cats inside the office. We have three dogs hmm. there and we have another 15 cats outside the office, hmm. which we have built roof shelters for and are responsible for feeding them. Then we've started a foundation called Tint. 
mm. and Amoli, where we provide foster care services for animals in need. Okay. Especially post medical care services, mm. because after an animal is treated, mm-hmm. yeah, a stray animal has nowhere to go. Mm. So on the road gets infected again. Yeah. So until they are well, mm. we have a place where they can recuperate. What do you do uh, with Diwali celebrations? Well, all we can do with Diwali celebrations right now is bring out awareness of the plight of animals there. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do. And we can hope that people become more sensitive and realize the impact that loud firecrackers have. Yeah. Not only on animals, but on human beings. Yes. Yeah, I mean, even if you're not thinking about them, think about yourself. Mm-hmm. If you look at the pollution levels, mm-hmm. Mumbai has very gradually and slowly moved beyond Delhi. Yeah. Nobody's talking about it. Yeah, but the yeah. pollution levels in Andheri were 304, Delhi was 248. <laughs> This is air pollution. Air pollution. Mm. Yeah, and crackers only add to it. Yeah. How, how about noise pollution? That's rarely discussed. Well, I, I guess when you don't have dal chawal to eat, you won't speak about biryani. Mm, right. So I guess noise pollution is another luxury, mm. which we win the basic battle of survival. Yeah. yeah, breathing, our air. Then we come to our ears. But the way things are going, uh, I have a cough. Mm-hmm. Most of the people I know has a, have a cough. Yeah. The GP tells me that if you want, don't want to have the cough, go out of Bombay. I swear. Yeah. I was told the same thing. I think we are a self-destructive species. <laughs> so what is Tinte? The full form is this is not the end. Mm-hmm. We aim at getting together those in need. Animals and birds on one side. Mm-hmm. and uh, senior citizens on the other. Mm. Senior citizens, again, are this entire resource which people don't even regard as one. Yeah. And when people cross the age of 60, mm. society tends to look upon them as having lost their use mm. for society. Whereas they are the treasure house of knowledge, and experience and wisdom, mm-hmm. which they have garnered over the 60 years of their life, which nobody values. Mm. Now, if we can get senior citizens and animals to resettle under one ecosystem, mm. where both at that point in time need love and recognition, they can provide those to each other and be a support system for each mm. other. That is the kind of ecosystem I'm building yeah. with a few friends of mine together as Tint. Mm. And our first small step in the journey is the foundation we have set up at Amboli. Mm. Now, slowly, we are learning from our experiences there and we are building more and more such foundations. Soon, we are planning to take up land Mm. where we will set up communities and ecosystems of elderly people and animals together. Mm. Uh, Tell us about the recent awards. The lockdown. Mm. Yeah. Because in every adversity lies opportunity. True. And you can say the lockdown is probably the biggest adversity to mankind in the recent, Mm. I don't know, century or something, at least. Mm, Yeah. And uh, something which has never been seen before, where you are a prisoner in your own home Mm. and at any time susceptible to a life-threatening ailment. Yeah. And uh, what I looked upon it as an opportunity to develop the skills that I always wanted to. Mm which were that of being uh, a lyricist, Mm -hmm. a composer of my own independent songs, Mm -hmm. a director, and an editor. Mm. And I developed all those. One thing at that point in time, what I realized is, that if we were to survive the lockdown, competitors need to become collaborators. And we often look at other people as competitors. Why look upon them as competitors? Every competitor is a potential collaborator. Yeah. And when you make music together, Mm -hmm. I think it uh, enhances and expands exponentially. One plus one doesn't make two, it makes Mm -hmm. 11. At that point in time, I was thinking of making a track for uh, Independence Day. Mm -hmm. Never done one. So I said, chalo, we've got the time. Mm -hmm. So um, started the composition and uh, got some musicians into the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, I realized that this track deserves something bigger. Mm. 
What what track did you choose? Vande Matram. Uh-huh. Fresh composition. Yeah. And using only two words, Vande Matram. Mm-hmm. That's it. He said, let's get more composers onto it. So I spoke to my friends, Justin Uday, mm-hmm. then uh, Somesh Mathur. Mm-hmm. And said that, yeah, this track, I'd love your inputs on it. So got them on board. Then got Tapas on board. Mm-hmm. Vipin Mishra on board. Yeah. And slowly, slowly, the track was progressing. We said, let's get 50 composers on board. So I said, okay, it's possible. Why not? Between us, we can get more composers. So Justin, Uday, Somesh and me. Mm. And uh, with Ravi Rajji from the MCI, Mm -hmm. we approached other composers and we said, this is our message uh, where creativity, creation, collaboration and celebration Hmm. All together. Let's all come together. That message Mm -hmm. for India and the new world. My mind just goes blank when I even think of who all came. Adnan Sami came on. Hari Haran came on. Shankar came on. And we got to the figure of 100 composers. (laughs) When we started off, we never even thought Hmm. that we are going to get 100 composers to work on this track. And the track came out really beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, that track won 65 awards across the world. Right. Wow. And the Prime Minister tweeted Mm. on that track regarding the message that the track gave. And what was the message? Again, Mm. it was basically on Atma Nirbhar Bharat. Mm. It was basically self-sufficiency. You have everything you need, Mm. but you don't realize it. What were some of these awards? Some of these awards were the Intercontinental Music Award, the Global Music Award, uh, the London Mo- uh, Movie Awards, the Independent Film Awards, entire list that is there, certificates. I mean, I've stopped putting up the certificates mm. now because I don't have place. <laughs> so just a few key awards. Khan's Awards, mm. we won. Three awards from Khan's. When you get awards from places and people who don't know you, mm. that is the real award. Yeah. Because you have no... Pressure you're exerting on people. Mm. There's nothing, no link you have with the award issuing committee. Yeah. But you're still getting the award. That's the genuinity of an award. And that mm. those are the kind of awards that I treasure and value most. So we've won at least uh, 200 awards. And uh, mm. we've released other songs also. We did, uh, after Vande Matram, the challenge was how do you get something which is bigger than this? Mm. So we did Jago Zara. For Women Equality Day. Yeah. And that had 150 women artists from across the world. Mm. 11 countries. And uh, some legends like Farida Khanam, Farida Khanam Ji, mm-hmm. Chitra Ji, mm. Usha Uttub Ji, yeah. Sharada Sinha Ji, among others were there in that. And that was again something that I look back and feel a sense of pride. Mm. Having been instrumental in creating something so beautiful and monumental. What was your favorite bit of the process? Favorite bit of the process was assimilation. Mm. You've recorded all these fantastic artists from all over. How much to retain and how much to eliminate. Right. Where to position it. Because those kind of songs are created on the editing table. Mm. You've got your base structure in place. Yeah. But then when you're designing the final song, that point in time is truly challenging because mm. you're not only designing to audio, but you're also designing to video. Mm. The video also has to look equally good. So things have to be double synced. Yeah. Double challenge. That's how my skills as a uh, video director and editor mm. again got enhanced in the process. Mm. I got awards for best lyricist, best director and best editor also. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. How do you take that creative call when you have so many stalwarts um, performing essentially the same kind of music? How do you decide? The only thing that matters at that point in time is the creativity and nothing else. Hmm. The stature of the artist does not matter. Hmm. The decisions are taken because of what is important for the work of creation. Right. 
and everyone who's inter- instrumental at that point in time in making it more beautiful mm-hmm. is important. Mm. There's nobody big, nobody small. Everybody's the same. Mm. If something sounds better because of that, we use that. Mm. How long did it take for this to come about? Vande Matram took all of 15 days. Wow, that was fast. 15 days from start to to finish the sensor certificate in hand <laughs> and uh, i really slept for any of those 15 days mm. because uh, i had to coordinate every aspect of the song and we had a deadline mm. and, and everybody was working out of their home studios is it yeah <laughs> everybody was shooting at home recording at home That's so right. the lockdown provided any and more challenge than was uh, there at that point in time but i think that if it was not for the lockdown it would have never happened so challenge yes but also um, opportunity and focus right 15 days is incredible yes 15 days of pure focus hmm. which would never have been possible <laughs> if the lockdown wasn't there yeah and availability yeah how could all of these artists be available if not for the lockdown hmm and then jago zara we felt that how do you move on from 100 mm-hmm. so we went to 150 yeah and uh, 150 women per se mm-hmm. so even bigger challenge mm-hmm. like sourcing uh, women achievers in the field of music yeah and across and countries. that to across countries mm-hmm. so we managed it because if you believe it can be done it can be done mm-hmm. and uh, extremely enjoyable process and people were much more amenable because they saw what we'd done with vande matram mm. we proved ourselves once mm. so the second time round people were much more receptive and that's how we managed to get so many legends mm. and that took one month mm. but we also got the macedonian uh, symphony orchestra to play for it so how did they track they tracked in macedonia i tracked them remotely ah. while supervising from uh, my uh, room itself mm-hmm. japji uh, singh walia walicha mm. he was my uh, arranger and conductor he he tracked it from my room and we supervised it mm. and we okayed it we had booked a two hour session with them mm. we completed it wow <laughs> so that was a beautiful experience in itself what about uh, all the other awards which is the one that is sort of the crown jewel Which is the song called "I See the Light," mm. which I had both written and composed. Mm. We got the award for best funk song at the Intercontinental Music Awards for North America. Mm. Now we're taking a style in which the Americans are good in mm. winning the award in their own country. Yeah, yeah. how do you qualify for that? Well, I guess you'd ask the judges about that. I send in my entries, and if they like it, it qualifies. Do, do you routinely uh, send in uh, your entries, or do you have a team that takes care of? I it? take care of it myself. Okay. So every yes. entry is curated and sent by me, mm-hmm. depending on the kind of composition, kind of music video, mm-hmm. kind of song, and uh, the award that it should go to. So now I've kind of shortened my uh, purview to only the more prestigious awards, mm-hmm. and I've eliminated uh, most of the others, because mm-hmm. you learn along the way that which awards matter the most, mm-hmm. and since you already won a lot of other awards, then you mm-hmm. don't need to repeat yeah. them again. How important do you think it is in a creative person's life, in a composer's mm-hmm. life, to prioritize? Um, sending entries for awards I think it's one of the most important things in any creative person's life mm. for two reasons at any point in time as a creative person we are seeking validation mm. but at every step of the journey we are treated with criticism and doubt negativity yeah we need reassurance we need self belief to be reinforced mm. and when you win an award in another country altogether mm. which matters then you feel that sense of resuscitation 
that yes, I am worthwhile. <laughs> My life is worth living, and what I am doing is worth doing, and that is something which is extremely important for any creative person. Mm. The second thing is what awards also create is credibility. Yeah, and credibility is something which is very important for clients also. Mm. If a client has seen that you won this many awards, you obviously are of a certain caliber. Mm. It definitely helps you build your future and uh, generate more work. Mm. So both ways, it is extremely important. What would your advice be to upcoming musicians slash session players slash composers? My advice to them would be: Do what you believe in. Mm. however difficult it may seem however you may feel that there is no market for it mm. but there's always a market it's a big world out there mm-hmm. you just need to find your niche and find your target audience because if you do something that you think is going to sell but you don't believe in it mm. nobody's going to buy it anyway mm. But if you put your hundred percent, your entire passion, energy, and focus mm. into what you believe in, there is nothing you can't achieve. Lovely. Thank you so much. Not sure.